I, uh, I've been involved in a number of the, 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 the main developments in translation studies over the, um, what is it now, 35 years of my career. And um, so that may, may give you some insight into um, what, uh, what has been going on, my perspective on it. Um, but also, um, I come from a time where there were no degrees in translation. Nobody, well, I don't know. In 1983, I got my PhD in English with a doctoral dissertation on, um, on American literature, and that was published in 1985. At that time, I believe I could not have gotten a PhD in translation or translation studies. And for many years, that was frustrating for me in the U.S. because in the U.S., translation studies professors are hired by foreign language. So if you have a, a Ph.D. in Spanish, say, and translate uh, from Spanish to English, you can get a job teaching translation studies in Department of Modern Languages. My my foreign main main source language is Finnish. I lived in Finland for 14 years, um, and I still translate quite a bit from Finnish. Um, and I have held a job, a, an associate professorship in Finnish English translation theory and practice at the University of Tampere from 1987 to 1989, and then I moved to the U.S. And until I got the current, my current job at, the, at uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen, I have been an English professor. Now, this is my last job. I will retire from this job in two and a half years. Uh, and so my second job as a professor was in translation studies. And my last job as a professor will be as uh, in translation studies. Um, but most of my career has been in English. So anyway, let's go back. I, uh, I, I wanted to be an exchange student after high school, and I applied uh, to Germany and got accepted. And then a month before I was supposed to leave, they called and said, we're very sorry. Germany has lowered their quota to 30. You're number 44. Would you rather go to Finland or Holland? And I said, Holland. They said, okay, you're going to Holland. One week before I was supposed to leave, they called and said, we're so sorry about this, but Holland is out. Are you willing to go to Finland? And I said, yes. And they said, you're leaving today. So I spent, as I was 16 years old, I spent 13 months in Finland. I learned Finnish fluently and I loved it there. And I decided I would live there the rest of my life. I had to go back to the U.S. for two years, the visa requirements, and as soon as I could, I went back to Finland, finished my university degree there, and at the age of 20, got hired as a, a, an acting junior, professor, junior lecturer of English in, at the University of Uvascula. Um, I, within two years, I believe, I was appointed to, a, a, I, I got job security in that position. Um, and I ended up doing that job for, during that time, uh, the English department, the main office, would get phone calls from other people in the, in the university saying, do you have anyone who translates from Finnish to English? Since I was the only native speaker of English with fluent Finnish, the secretary would come to me. Are you willing to do a translation? I'd say, yes. What I discovered was that I loved translating. It was an absolute thrill for me. So I translated things from uh, the university and then increasingly from the community, from the city, um, for those five years. Um, and in about 1979 or 1980, I decided I really needed to go to, back to the U.S. to get a Ph.D. And as I was making plans to do that, it occurred to me that it might be nice to know whether anybody had ever written anything about translation. Maybe someday I might want to write about translation. 
And I tucked that away. I went to the U.S. and got my Ph.D. in English, wrote a dissertation on, doc, on, on American literature, came back, um, had a job in Finland. Uh, I was on leave from, and I, I returned to Finland, although I didn't return to my actual job. I took further leave from that job in order to, to work as an acting associate professor of English at the University of Tampere in 1983. And I... Revised my dissertation, got it accepted for publication, and at that point I thought, now's the time to go check to see if anyone has ever written about translation. So I went to the university library, and there were about 10 or 12 books on the shelves about translation. Most of them were did not look very promising. They were um, often badly published um, they, they were they were not really addressing major issues. They were like suggested uh, exercises for translation and so on between Finnish and English. But one of the books on the shelf then was George Steiner's After Babel. It had been published in 1975 by Oxford University Press. This was 1984 or so. So it had been around for nine years. I checked that out. I read it and I absolutely loved it. I was thrilled by that book. I liked it so much that I read it a second time immediately. And that was really my graduate education in translation studies, literary hermeneutical translation studies. And for many, many years as a translation scholar, I called myself a hermeneutical scholar of translation because of George Steiner. It was so uh, powerful for me that I immediately started getting ideas for writing my own things. And the first thing I wrote was uh, a bilingual book in Finnish and English, uh, an experimental book written um, written by it, first in English and then translated. I translated it myself into Finnish. And as I translated it, I kept thinking of my Finnish audience and how my Finnish audience would pull me in different directions. Um, and so I would sometimes deviate from the English text in order to explore the Finnish side of things and then gradually try to drag it back, drag the Finnish back into alignment with the English. And I published that. Uh, I didn't publish it. I uh, photocopied it. I made 10 copies and handed it out to friends. And they started coming back to me saying, um, could you make five more? My friends want some. And I ended up making a total of maybe 30 or 40. And we had a colloquium on it in about 1985 or 86. And it turns out there are five of those, five copies of, of the, the, the 30 or so I made in Finnish libraries, university libraries now. Um, they have survived. And I have some on, on my own shelf as well. Um, but based on that book, which never, never got published, um, the Finnish academic publishing industry was rather primitive at the time and uh, very conservative. And so what I was doing was was sort of out of their wheelhouse and nobody wanted to publish it. So it remained unpublished. But then um, based on that book, I got appointed to an associate professorship of Finnish English translating translation theory and practice at the University of Tampere. I did that for two years, as I mentioned before. One of my colleagues was Justa Holtzmanteri, Justa Holtz was the uh, the um, one of the, the founders of Scopos theory. Um, in 1984, her dissertation was uh, was defended. She defended it in Finland. Uh, her husband, somebody Mantari, um, I never met him, so I don't know, know if they were still married. But her name was Justa Holtz her German name, and then Mantari was at the end, Man Holtz Mantari. Anyway, I got to know her very well. She was my colleague in the department. Uh, I learned about Scopos theory from her. She she was good friends with Hans Vermeer. She brought him in several times to give guest lectures. Um, Justa had almost no English, so she and I spoke Finnish. Um, Hans Vermeer was was fluent in English, so he and I spoke, spoke English. Um, my German is passable, but not exactly conversational. I can read from it, read in it well. Anyway, uh, 
during those two years at the University of Tampere as professor, associate professor of Finnish English translation theory and practice, I cannibalized my bilingual book as the translator's turn. The translator's turn was published in 1991, actually the last week of 1990 with a 1991 um, publication date. And I was sure that this, this book that I was, was so weird, so strange, so different from anything anyone else had written about translation that was probably unpublishable, like that first one. And so I went to uh, in the US, Johns Hopkins University Press, who had published my dissertation. And to my surpi surprise, they took it, they accepted it. And I thought, okay, well, that's nice, you know. It'll, but Johns Hopkins was not, a tr and has never been, a translation studies press. And so I thought, okay, so it's being published by a night writing for. I was writing it for myself, really. Um, and I, I just, I just met my PhD students this morning um, over Zoom, and um, and told them this is a similar story, saying you have to write for an audience. Except that my first book on translation. The translator's turn, I did not write for an audience. I just got lucky. Well, sort of lucky and unlucky at the same time because there were a, it was a double response to that book. Um, the top people, people like Gideon Turi, um, Theo Hermans, Andre Lefebvre, um, they attacked it. Lawrence Venuti, he was just getting started then, but but they all attacked it. They, they thought it was absurd, it was stupid. Um, it was amateurish and so on. Um, but the, it turned out, to my good fortune, there was a secondary audience that was less well-placed. They were not full professors. Um, they had not published on translation, but they were typically translators who were also just getting started as assistant professors in various universities around the world. They had no institutional <clears throat> prestige or power, but somehow, I have no idea how, they found this book. They picked it up, and by word of mouth, uh, the reputation of that book spread around the world, and to my great surprise, I started getting invited around the world to give guest lectures and workshops on translation. By the time that book was published, I had already left Finland. I was in the U.S., I, I worked in the U.S. from 1989 to 2010 at the University of Mississippi. And uh, at that time, it seemed to me there was no translation studies in the U.S. at all. There's not much now. There's more now than there was in 1989, but not much. I started going to American Translators Association conferences, started meeting other translators, project managers, agency owners, and a handful of translation scholars. And by the end of that decade, around 1997 or 98, I started thinking, I'd, I'd been to EST, an EST conference, European Society of Translation Studies, and to uh, a CATS trans, uh, conference, Canadian Association of Translation Studies. And so I started thinking, we need an American Translation Studies Association, ATSA. So I created a listserv for all the trans American translation scholars that I had gotten to know through ATA, American Translators Association. And we started meeting, discussing things on the listserv and meeting at ATA meetings and conferences. And in 2002, we created that society, that association. A few years later, the name was changed to the American Translation and Interpreties, Interpreting Studies Association. Now it's ATISA. Uh, we started the, um, the, the journal. It ended up being quite an influential journal. Um, but I used to joke back in those days that I had to leave the country to be a translation scholar. Um, because there just wasn't anything going on in translation studies at the time. By, uh, I, I should should mention that my translator's turn um, had been caught up in what was then being called the cultural turn in translation studies. 
And I enthusiastically threw myself into that. I started reviewing cultural studies, uh, cultural turn books in translation studies. And I published uh, two more books in the, in the 90s. I published uh, Translation and Taboo in 96. And then my, my, my textbook, Becoming a Translator, and my anthology, Western Translation Theory from Herodotus to Nietzsche in 1997, plus two other books. Um, and then I guess that was it for the 90s. But by 1999 or 2000, I was starting to get tired of the cultural turn. And what, what really sort of was the turning point for me was that um, I was sent an essay collection by the University of Massachusetts Press to vet for publication. And I've, I recommended publication. It was a very well-written book uh, by 10 or 12 translation scholars. But what I noticed reading that book for the, the press was that every single one used exactly the same paradigm, which was the cultural turn, right? So it wasn't surprising, but you know, in the 80s, when I was getting started, the linguists were in charge and we were trying to overthrow that. We were trying to shift translation studies from the linguistic study of equivalence, semantic equivalence, dynamic equivalence, whatever, to uh, a, an approach to translation studies that takes culture into consideration, uh, especially things like feminism and um, and post-colonialism, and by the late 90s, that had happened. The, the turn, the cultural turn, had completely ousted the linguist, linguists. The linguists were began to, uh, to turn to critical discourse analysis, um, Norman Fairclough, uh, for, to, to, to talk about ideology linguistically, to, to make linguistics more like the cultural turn. As a result of my uh, disaffection, I, I pulled out of translation studies for most of the first decade of the 21st century. I, uh, I was doing rhetoric and semiotics and uh, comparative literary theory. Oh, and writing studies. But at some point, I got an idea for, uh, for a book and started writing it on translation. And that became Translation and the Problem of Sway, which was not published until 2011. And by that time, I had already moved to Hong Kong. I moved to Hong Kong in 2010. And that was really, really the beginning of my uh, workaholic approach to translation studies. Um, translation studies is really, really hot in greater China, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Macau. In Taiwan, not so much, but, but in ma mainland China and uh, Hong Kong and Macau, translation studies is one of the, the hottest subjects around. And so I came in to that with a bit of a reputation and was immediately caught up in the the excitement, there was, there was so much going on in translation studies, so many conferences, so many guest lectures, um, so much discussion of translation at various universities. Um, I was invited to, to mainland China four or five times a year to give guest lectures. Every time I would arrive at a, at a lecture in mainland China, uh, the excitement was was palpable. I was like a rock star. It was amazing to me. In the US, as a translation scholar, I had been nothing, nobody. Uh, some people remembered the work I had done in literature, but in Hong Kong, I was a star, and, and greater China generally. And that sort of uh, accelerated my, um, my work in the field. So I began to write a lot more and publish a lot more in um, in translation studies, including in 2013, uh, which was the 200th anniversary of 
uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher's um, über, die, uh, über die verschiedenen Methoden des Übersetzens. I wrote and published Schleiermacher's Icoses in the bicentennial year, uh, the first book length um, commentary on Schleiermacher's Academy Address um, in English, or I believe any language uh, at the time. Two years later, in 2015, I published the Tao of Translation, drawing on uh, ancient Chinese thought and applying it to translation. Uh, in 2016, I was asked to review a book. That book turned into an article. That I mean, that review turned into an article. The article turned into a book uh, called Semio Translating Purse on semi the semiotics of translation through Persian eyes, but also applied to the translation of Peirce and of Wittgenstein. In 2017, I published those four books that, that Maud Grugato mentioned, um, Exorcising Translation Towards Intercivilizational Turn, um, which was basically uh, an engagement with Takai Naoki, who... Um, who mentioned that, because uh, he, he's a, a Japanese theorist, and he, he has an article saying that uh, Asian theory is taken to be a, a contradiction in terms because Asians can't theorize and theorists can't be Asian. Uh, and he is obviously a, a very influential, very powerful Asian theorist. And he, he used the... Um, the the image of um, of the Asian theorist as a kind of ghost or haunt, and so I wrote exorcising translation to explore that whole situation, and it was actually that was actually a split off of the book Critical Translation Studies, which is about Na Sakai Naoki and Lydia Liu, um, the the Chinese. Uh, theorist of translation uh, who is at Columbia. That same year, I published Alexis Kivi and As World Literature. Um, so after working on Peirce and then uh, Asian translation theory, I turned to my personal wheelhouse, namely Finnish, translating from Finnish. Alexis Kivi is Finland's first great novelist. He died in 1872. His 1870 novel, uh, I, I was translating at the same time uh, from 2015 to 2016. And so I, I wrote this, this monograph on translating Kiwi uh, alongside the, uh, the, the translation I was doing. Um, and then translationality, essays in the translational medical humanities. And um, that is, has been, interesting lately because uh, a, a British woman in Portugal named Karen Bennett uh, read and, and was, was asked to review translationality. And in the conclusion to that book, she found a reference, my reference to what I called inter-epistemic translation. I said, in addition to, to Roman Jakobson's three types of translation, intralingual, interlingual, and intersemiotic, we need to have intersemiotic, inter-epistemic translation, translation between epistemic regimes or systems. And Karen and Bennett turned that brief mention into a research project and enlisted me as a consultant. And that project is now off the ground and running. We just had our first inaugural conference on that in Lisbon uh, in mid-December of last year. And um, that book, Translationality, turned out to be, it's on everybody's lips. Everybody at the, at the conference mentioned it, discussed it. It was very um, exciting and flattering for me. Um, then in 2019, I published, actually, this is a, a, an interesting story. Um, I was invited to the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, by an Italian translation scholar named Marco Sonzogni. And um, 
he hired Michael Cronin and me to give uh, keynote lectures on eco-translation or eco-translatology. Michael Cronin had just published his book, Eco-Translation, and I had published um, a book called The Deep Ecology of Rhetoric in Mencius and Aristotle, not about translation, but about rhetoric in an ecological context. And so Marco brought the two of us to, to um, New Zealand to, uh, to talk about ecological approaches to translation. What he didn't tell us before we arrived, however, was that he had been unable to get proper funding with that topic. And so he shifted the topic to include transgender uh, and other gender related issues. So the very first session, I guess, um, my my keynote was the first in the conference, and then we had a two and a half hour session on transgender, and it was it was transformative. It was transformative. Uh, I was really excited about it. Um, I found so much in that in that session uh, innovative and and um, inspiring. And so at the end of the of the, the session, uh, I went up to Marco and I said, Marco, you never guess what happened. He said, well, I can guess. You're going to write a book about it. <laughs> and I said, how did you guess? He says, Doug, I know you. I've read your work. This is the kind of thing you do. Um, it, in fact, this is an inter-epistemic translation between translation studies and transgender studies, right? Two different epistemic systems and I was exploring a bridge, an inter-epistemic bridge between them. So that came out in 2019, and Marco had me back down to New Zealand to uh, to launch it. I gave a, had a book launch down there, and um, it was very well attended. Apparently, uh, Wellington, the capital of New Zealand, is also the the capital of transgender existence and study in New Zealand, and so. It, it was very well attended and um, got a very positive response. And then people say, how can you possibly write six books a year? Well, I don't. Sometimes at, mo at most three books a year, but never six. But between 2019 and 2022, I published no books at all. So those got delayed. There was, there was a, a, a lag in the publication of a number of books. So in 2022, I published The Strange Loops of Translation, another inter-epistemic translation between Douglas Hofstadter's cognitive science, in which he invents the term strange loops and develops strange loops as a model for the development of consciousness. And so, but and, and Douglas Hofstadter is also a translator. He has translated um, Pushkin and uh, two other books, I believe. I'm not remembering the name of the, he, he translated the other two from French, Pushkin from Russian. Um, and he has written extensively on translation. Um, he wrote a whole big fat monograph um, called um, Le Tombeau du Marot in French um, on translation. And he invited me to, to his seminar, his doctoral seminar on translation studies um, in uh, around the same time that book came out, 1997, I believe it was, 98. Um, <clears throat> so translation, The Strange Leaps of Translation is an attempt to explore the, uh, an inter-epistemic middle ground between Strange Loops theory in cognitive science and Translation. Um, it, it, it was amazing to me reading back through Hofstetter's work, which I knew fairly well, but I hadn't read in several years. Looking back through it, it was amazing to me that he had not himself thought to apply strange loops to the study of translation. His, his, his work on translation was not particularly um, intelligent. His work on cognitive science is brilliant, uh, world leading and so on. But uh, making the jump to translation studies was difficult for him. And so 
I decided I'd make it for him. Um, and then last year, six books. The f actually, the first three or four came out in 2022, but with a 2023 publication date. The first was Translation as a Form, um, the first book length commentary on Walter Benjamin's Die Aufgabe des Übersetzers, the, the task of the translator in English. There were two previous book length uh, commentaries on the essay, one in French by Antoine Bermond, one in German by Hans Vermeer. Fortunately, since I don't read French, uh, Chantal Wright had translated the Berman into English, um, but I but I got a copy of the um, the German um, from a Turkish scholar who had worked with Femer on on Berman, on Benjamin, and uh, I read I read the German uh, commentary and and published this first um, first commentary uh, book length commentary on on Benjamin. Um, in July of 2022, which gave the book a chance to be picked up, found by Benjamin scholars all across Europe. And so I was invited to two different um, celebrations of the, the centennial of the, two, the 1923 publication of the Aufgabe des Übersetzers. Then let's see, uh, the behavioral economics of translation an inter-epistemic translation between behavioral economics and translation. Uh, I began by thinking, by reading Daniel Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow, Thinking, comma, Fast and Slow, um, and getting very excited about that, about behavioral economics. And what I was originally planning to do was to... Uh, to talk about the difference between classical economics and behavioral economics in terms of rationalist versus irrationalist approaches to human decision making. Classical economics does posit the fundamental rationality of the economy, that because economic decision makers are rational in the aggregate, the economy is rational in the aggregate. And what uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky did in the 1970s in Jerusalem, where they were both professors, was to come up with a series of, of experiments. They would just run the experiments with whoever they could find. The experiments were, experiments were all about decision-making. A one in 50 chance of earning $100 or a, a one in five chance of winning $5, which would you take or something like that? And what they found was that uh, if you do the math for, these, for all these, these, these different experiments, they, they must have done hundreds of these experiments. If you do the math, one is likelier to, um, to give you a good result and therefore should be chosen. What they found was that people almost always chose the less rational choice, made the less rational choice, which is to say that human decision-making in the aggregate is not rational, but irrational. So they started publishing their findings and classic, classical economists started saying, well, you're just uh, do it, running these tests on stupid people. So they started running the tests on classical economists. And the classical economists had the exact same result. They too chose the irrational decision. And further, when these supposedly rational economists had it explained to them why their choice was irrational, they refused to change their mind. They clung to the irrational decision and kept finding all kinds of bogus reasons why their choice was preferable. 
In other words, they weren't just irrational, they were stubbornly irrational. And these were the top economists in the world. This led to the creation of a whole new subfield of, e of economics called behavioral economics. And the main founders of this uh, all got Nobel Prizes in e e economics. My idea was I would look at classical rationalist translation studies like Andrew Chesterman and compare that with um, the kind of translation studies that I like to do, which is hermeneutical and is not so focused on rational choices or irrational choices, but on how human beings make sense of things. Hermeneutics, right? Studying interpretation. And I would use behavioral economics to, as a kind of way of organizing a hermeneutical approach to translational choices. Um, what I, what happened though, is, is I found uh, an article by a woman named Michelle Chihara pointing out that behavioral economics was a good old boy club, that all of the behavioral economists were male. And they, they, what they were basically doing from her point of view was uh, redefining or reframing masculinity economically. So in classical economics, the male decision maker is basically enlightenment man. Um, the upper class, often aristocratic white males in Europe <clears throat> who ran everything back then in the 18th century, um, <clears throat> they were the rational ones. Um, that was the image of masculinity, right? It's good to be rich, powerful, white, and male, right? All of those. Then you can call how you think rational and compare that with um, the behavioral econom economists who were all about making mistakes and realizing mistakes and exploring mistakes and so on. And so the, the image of masculinity in behavioral economics, according to Michelle Chihara, was the, uh, the ordinary guy, the ordinary husband, and father, a middle class guy who's who who means well. He's not he's not some sort of master of the universe. He's just an ordinary guy. But he's still still very masculine and still excluding women from purview. So I I said, this is a this is I, I, I can't really just do what I was planning. What I was planning was the same kind of old boys club that um, that Michelle Chihara was pointing out. And so I expanded it to include uh, econs, the imaginary rational males, um, humans, the behavioral econo economic men's, but, but divide human humans into masculine humans, feminine humans, and queer humans, picking up the queerness from my transgender book. Uh, and that came out last year. Then uh, questions for translation studies, which I um, was was the product of a teaching situation. I was teaching Anthony Pym's exploring translation theories to my MA students at CUHK Shenzhen, and um, there were numerous moments in that semester. This would have been um, two years ago. No, two years ago. Numerous moments where we came upon a question that we couldn't answer. Either Pim raised it and couldn't answer it, or it occurred to me and I couldn't answer it, or a student asked it and nobody could answer it. And so I started thinking about those questions and jotting them down, and that eventually turned into this book, Questions for Translation Studies, published by John Benjamins uh, last year. Uh, and what I did was to take three key moments, key words in equivalence theories, semantic equivalence, dynamic equivalence, and deverbalization, then three key words in um, descriptive translation studies, norms, laws, and narr narrator or narratoriality, and then a conclusion. And just ask a series of questions. It's a, 
a classical genre called questiones, where you make an argument in the form of questions and answers. So you ask a question, you answer it. The, the answer uh, pr promotes another, pr provokes another question, and you, you proceed that way by, by, as a kind of ongoing Q&A. Uh, I wrote another monograph on, um, on a Finnish author. Alexis Kivi was Finnish, Finland's greatest 19th century author, the, the founder of Finnish literature, and Voltaire Kilpi was Finnish, fin, Finland's greatest modernist author. So I wrote that book called Translating the Monster, Voltaire Kilpi, An Orbit, Orbit Beyond Untranslatability. And then the, four, the, the sixth book, oh, there was, primary translation was also 2023. It was a kind of research handbook. The sixth book in 2023 was the beginning of a new approach for me, experimental translation. Um, I wrote this book called The Experimental Translator. There's a, a short monograph published with um, Paul Grave Macmillan. And then uh, that didn't satisfy me, so I wrote two other experimental books on experimental translation. They're both forthcoming um, this year. The first one is called Translator Tourette, as in Tourette syndrome. Um, and the su subtitle of that is Avant-Garde Translation and the Tourette Sublime. That's coming out with, of Brill. And the, the third one on experimental translator, translation is called Lessons Experimental Translators Can Learn from Finnegan's Wake translouting that gas wind into turfish. And that is um, a short, all three of those are short monographs. Uh, and the, the, uh, the Joyce one is coming out from Routledge. Um, I also have uh, a full monograph coming out this year called Translating the Non-Human, What Science Fiction Can Tell Us About Translation. And um, since I'm Speaking to, uh, to Poland, I thought I would mention that um, in the in the um, in that book on science fiction, I um, I mentioned in fact I have three novels, three American science fiction novels: uh, Samuel Delaney's Babel Seventeen, um, Suzette uh, Elgin Hayden's Hayden Elgin's book uh, Native Tongue. And um, the st story of your life by Ted Chung, which was made into the movie um, Arrival. That's right. But in the course of that, I, I do st do talk some about um, Stanislas Lem's Salyaris. Um, I'm not sure whether that's how you pronounce it in, in, in Polish. I've only seen the Russian, the Tarkovsky movie. Uh, and, and also read the novel, of course. And in Russian, of course, you say Salyaris. My situation right now, after 21 years at the University of Mississippi, 10 years at Hong Kong Baptist University, first three years as dean, and then seven years as uh, a chair professor of uh, translation, intercultural studies, and no, translation, interpreting, and intercultural studies. Um, I am now professor of translation studies. I had to retire from HKBU uh, at 65, and now I just I'm halfway through my fourth year at Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen as professor of translation studies, and we are in our second year of a PhD program, which is very exciting. Our, we we brought in our first cohort a year and a half ago, and. Um, we, there were five of us supervisors, and we were able to choose five uh, supervisees. And the 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 young woman that I chose was a former MA student of mine, absolutely brilliant. I'm thrilled to be supervising her, and <clears throat> we've just have, we're, we're just bringing in uh, uh, getting our, our 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 second year, our uh, the the first year cohort of the second year. Um, this year, and we are gearing up to to uh, recruit our third year cohort now for next September.